Hello and welcome back ladies and gentlemen to Beyond the Summer presentation of the iLeague Season 3 Dota 2 Chinese Qualifiers. Here we've got Newbie versus Dream Gaming here in a two game series here in the group stage of iLeague and it is 6.84 and I am also not Zyclops. I know I was telling you at the tail end of that last series that uh, Zyclops is going to be filling in for this one so that I could be ready for a European tournament that, over that might overlap if the games go long. Well, uh, in this case, uh, he did have some delays. I'll be covering one more game, and then he'll be picking up the last best of, well, I, it's not a best of one, but it is last game of the best of two, and we'll be seeing that in a few minutes here. So once again, thanks for tuning in here to Beyond the Summit, and uh, we'll go through the draft for one more Radiant Chinese game team. with, of course, myself, Blaze, as your host. So going into the draft, we see Newbie banned out the Spearbreaker, Queen of Pain, Dream Gaming banning out the Earthshaker and the Undying. So we're going to see instead the Shadowfiend Rubik opener from Newbie and Venge and Leshrac coming out for DG. So Venge Leshrac, pretty interesting. I think this combo can work out pretty well. Uh, just generally speaking, it's a powerful opener where you just go max magic missile build, get the splitter to follow it up, and you get kills all over the place. The amount of damage that Leshrac can put out now, as long as he has a little bit of setup, is pretty ridiculous. So Venge Lesh. Very powerful combo, a lot of early game aggression, and it could fuel the momentum that Leshrac could actually become a full-on carry, rather than just kind of like a tempo hero. So we'll see how that pans out, but yep, yeah, once again, thanks for tuning in. Uh, we're going into phase two, and I'll update the title of the broadcast remaining. right now, just for you guys. Five seconds remaining. Reserve there time. you go. Alrighty, so, as uh, we were saying, we do have Viper and Medusa banned out. I'm very surprised about the Medusa ban. I think the Viper ban makes sense. The SF wants to have a good laning phase. Is there anything that would be weak to Medusa here for newbie? Um, I can't see anything. Like, I mean, Stone Gaze is frustrating to push into sometimes. Uh, Mana Burn can be problematic, but generally speaking, 6.84 games haven't been going all that late game. Uh, I've seen ad I've seen one game go over an hour. Otherwise, it's 45 minutes or less for pretty much everything. And uh, it's pretty intense all the while, so there's action no matter what. But it is really interesting to see the Medusa ban when I don't think that that hero would be able to come online in time to be too threatening. But we see here, the Brewmaster, the Clockwork, they're banned out. And Dream Gaming, go ahead with the Ninth Stalker. So, while I'm not necessarily confident in Dream Gaming's uh, potential to take games off of Newbie, like as far as the tier level, the mechanical skill and experience of the players individually, I do like their draft. I think that they're drafting really strong here, and that Teal is setting them up for success with this very aggressive, active early game lineup. I mean, Venge, Leshrac, Night Stalker, this is a gank squad. This is a. a set of heroes that can just get kills all over the place and build that momentum into a high ground push pretty quickly. So I think there's a lot of potential with the lineup. The question is whether or not DG can execute on the level that's expected of them in order to really pull off a pull off a victory against Newbie. I mean it's definitely not the easiest thing to do. These guys are very experienced. These guys are you know international veterans and they are going to be using that experience to try to take the the right fights here but we've got team glowy eyes here red glowy eyes for mr sf green glowy eyes for mr rubik and remaining. white center war runner with just the whites of his eyes there shiny as can be Five seconds remaining. i guess uh you've got like little bug eyes for team dream gaming between those three heroes i'd say those are pretty Reserve bug eyed time. even if they're supposed to be humanoid or bats or i don't know but Anywho, enough about that. We're going to be going in to check out the last phase of this draft here. Right now we've got Newbie with a really good overall uh, team fighting lineup. With the Stampede and Requiem, they can pretty much take any engagement. But what they are lacking is uh, survivability against magic damage. If the Leshrac does turn out to be core, I think the Centaur, instead of going for like an Aghanim Scepter after Blink, should go for a Pipe of Insight as his kind of natural progression. Because that will allow him to go into the fights and just absolutely destroy the Leshrac's damage. Really limit the Pulse Nova damage output and the Lightning Storm as well. And that's going to be a pretty important aspect of controlling the, the fights as a whole. Uh, 
Admiral Kunkka. Admiral Kunkka's here. This is going to be pretty interesting. I'm curious what role they actually want to run the Kunkka. Looking at his changes and 6.84, I mean, they were kind of moderate, but uh, the biggest thing that I think is going to be really cool for the hero is that he doesn't have to turn to cast Torrent. And what that means is you can look any direction you want and cast the Torrent. It shows that you're raising your hand so they know they, they know the timing of the Torrent, but you don't have to point the direction the water is going to be spouting up. And that means that they, can make, they don't get to make assumptions of, oh, it's just in this line here. It's somewhere along this path. I just dodge to the left or the right, and I'm fine. No, in this, in this situation, Kunkka, the direction he's waving means nothing, and as long, it's just about the timing of him raising his hand for the torrent. So what that means, it's a lot easier to catch people with torrent when they can see you. Before it was, you can only really catch them if you're in the fog of war. Otherwise, they're going to be seeing it, they're going to be dodging it. So really cool to see that change here. X marks the spot cooldown, or mana cost went from 80 to 50, and the torrent cooldown... Uh, got reduced from 12 to 10. So, again, most of the torrent thing, but still, really cool. I mean, you get the magic missile, you get the torrent, you get the split earth, you've got a lot of chains done there in a small AO. So a lot of potential there for pickoffs, for team fights, Five little plays here remaining. and there. And also, a lot of people don't think about it this way, but Kunkka's boat provides a lot of survivability to your team. Obviously, the stun is really good against newbie in general, if they're not able to stampede, scatter away from it. But the big thing is the Kunkka's rum going overhead. You're going to be able to get a very tanky buff for the Leshrac. And though the Leshrac, if he can survive for 12 seconds in a fight, he can put out some massive damage. So the game plan of Newbie is to burst down this Leshrac, but with the Kunkka's Roam, that's much easier said than done. It's actually very difficult to burst somebody under those effects. It's a 50% mitigation, and it will delay the, the damage for at least 10 seconds, and then they start taking it over time. So pretty good to have that. I like the Necrophos band still. Uh, I'm not sure if they could have made it work in their lineup without running some of these heroes as a pretty hard support, but I still think it's a, a pretty solid pickup. Necrophos is very scary in this metagame, and we're going to see some more of him as people find ways to get far more efficiently on these int heroes. If they can protect the int heroes to get the farm with Hand of Midas and stuff like that, remaining. you're going to see those Octarine cores come out, and they're going to be really powerful on heroes Five that benefit from that remaining. cooldown reduction, like the Necrophos. Ancient Apparition is going to be the ban out here as, uh, again, it's just about surviving. If they had the Ancient Apparition Ice Blast and it gets uh, affected by that Ag Scepter, suddenly the Kunkka's Room becomes something fatal rather than something that takes you down to 1 HP. They still could go for something with a little bit of global damage. Zeus is still in the pool, for example, but generally speaking, you're not going to want it against this kind of a lineup. Uh, we're going to see Lifestealer come in. And it's kind of surprising to see the Lifestealer going up against the Centaur War Runner. I mean, he's really good against the Centaur and Bristlebag in terms of how tanky they are. They have a lot of HP for him to feast on. And, of course, he has good, uh, at least a good Infest Bomb with the Night Stalker, who's always in the enemy's face. But it's a little scary because the Stampede's going to allow Newbie to kite this Lifestealer, and he's not going to get as much direct damage in. So we'll see exactly his intentions, but at least for right now, we'll have to see... Him just kind of go into a kind of safe lane farming position most likely and uh, see how that works out for him. Now there's a couple members of Dream Gaming that I'm not as familiar with. They were being stood in for when I last cast them so I'm, I think I've got like three or four of their rosters pretty well in my brain but this Zov guy for the, playing the Lifestealer I don't really know too much about him. So we'll have to see what he's made of, what he's got to bring to the table. but. In the meantime, the last pickups here for newbie, the Bristleback, the Skyrath Mage. Um, just kind of pretty standard bread and butter supports. Um, Banana and Sanshin can do some really good work here with Skyrath Rubik. They're very familiar with this combo, and they can really disrupt what Dream Gaming have in mind with uh, Telekinesis, with the Silence and Slows. I really think there's a lot of potential for them to just kind of take the, the fights and the early skirmishes based on support movement alone. But we'll have to see. For right now, let's go ahead and introduce the two sides. Thanks once again for tuning in to iLeague here. This is the Chinese qualifiers, and we're going to see an early smoke coming in from Dream Gaming. So we're going to see Demons leading the charge with the Boots first, Vengeful Spirit. If they connect with that, they follow it up with Teal's Split Earth here on the core Leshrac, running Null Talisman to start. Well, that means uh, we're going to be seeing follow-through from the Life Stealer. That's going to be played by Zove, Ao is going to be on the Kunkka with that Torrent already up, and Jixing leading, <laughs> leading the Caboose with the Night Stalker. So they get one stun, they get the Split Earth, they get the Torrent misses, but it's still going to be First Blood 
Rabbit gets the stun off for the last second, but he still goes down to the less wreck. And now Sanchang's in a bad spot with no movement speed. 290 MS is nothing, and with the Void, they set up. Oh, it dodges the Blood Earth, but still goes down to the Magic Missile. So in the end, it's a double kill for the Teal. Suddenly, what turns into a, a good start for the Null Talisman less wreck turns into a great one, as he's going to have boots or bottle up very quickly. They're not going to be able to control the bottom bounty rune. It looks like that's going to be going to Moo on the Shadow Fiend. But still, they're going to be able to get the top one for whoever they desire. And it might be important to get that for the Kunkka to get his earlier level on the X mark, but it looks like they decided to give it to the Night Stalker, who's actually taking up the mid lane. So Jixing got pooled tangos. He's going for a bottle rush. This is a mid Night Stalker. And that leaves Knight the Leshrac in an aggro try. Actually going to see a catch out of the Vengeful Spirit. Torrent will help a little bit, but in the end, it's still going to be the first kill on the board for Newbie. Finding out the Venge, who uh, I think just went back for a ward. I'm not sure, but was in a bad position there. Yeah, she went back for this ward, it looks like. Or maybe it was just looking to stalk a courier. In either case. Because what some teams do is uh, they, as soon as they get the bounty rune on their mid laner, they buy tangos immediately and get it quarried out. So if she was kind of hiding out on this high ground, there's a chance that she could snipe the courier in the mid. But it doesn't work out that way. Instead, she gets killed off, but... Again, it is going to be this aggro try here. Support Kunkka, support Venge. They can combo up their skills pretty well, and Sancheng has to be very, very careful. This leaves two 1v1 matchups, the Night Stalker versus the Shadow Fiend. This favors SF quite significantly. Moo's going to be able to do some work here, even if Jixin got a good start. And then down bottom, it's Zove on the Lifestealer going up against the Bristleback played by June. And that's a tough one to call, honestly. I think both heroes have some strength to lend to this 1v1. But I think that June, if he plays it right, can actually destroy this Lifestealer. Having such low armor, it's uh, like at level 3, Bristleback's going to start getting very aggressive with these cool sprays, and you might be able to see a potential kill on the Lifestealer, at least him being forced back dramatically. He's got, however, Tango, Sav, he's got the Magic Stick, and Bristleback's already using quill sprays here, which it doesn't bode well. Right now, Jixing does have the option as a Midnight Stalker to just go for level 1 Void last hits. And, uh, yeah, right now he's actually going to be ranking it, so that's an interesting decision. It goes from 80, 90 to 100. You're going to be using your level 3 Void to harass and kill. You're going to be using your level 2 Void for very little. So oftentimes, you kind of hold that skill point, leave level 1 Void, and then you uh, use the Void to last hit and build yourself up. But... In this case, he doesn't. He gets his boots and his bottle. He doesn't really need every single little last hit. He's eight and one versus the moves twelve and three, and that seems to be sufficient for him. In the meantime, June here manning up against Life Stealer. It's going to be Feast versus Quills, and with the Mango available, the Life Stealer has to back up and pop his salve. But he's still got the Magic Stick in reserve, so I think that now June's going to uh, Zova's going to pull ahead in this lane. Double damage is going to be convenient for June, but without a bottle, it doesn't really make too much of a difference in the lane. The Leshrac only at level 2. That's one problem running this aggro try is you've got three level 2 heroes and with a couple of good pulls you're gonna see at least the carry in this safe lane position rabbit pull ahead and experience. Three level three and a half. As you can see in experience per minute that kinda maps it out a little bit less step functiony. So Night Stalker's topping out experience for a minute with the Shadow Fiend shortly behind. Then you've got the Soul Lenders down bottom, but Rabbit's doing pretty good. Rabbit is not doing bad at all in my mind, and uh, that's under some heavy pressure. So back over to last hits, we'll see that he's gotten 13 and 2, the Deleshrac only 10 and 1. But at level 3 and level 4, I would say DG's tri lane has a lot more aggressive potential. And he's going to just go for a Split Earth aided by that uh, Lightning Storm, almost enough to set up the Magic Missile. If they got that, that probably would have been a kill, but... Nope, he will be able to fall back here. Rabbit just gets a shared tango. June is going to be getting a bottle ferried out to him, and he needs that mana to really continue to fight in this lane. Mango's good for burst, but it's not a good for mana over time compared to like a clarity or a bottle. And so June does get this one picked up, and he'll probably go for the four minute rune spawn. It is also interesting that he goes for a poor man's shield here. Um I that, well, I mean, that's got to be intentional. You don't accidentally buy Slippers of Agility. So he just kind of finds it going to be valuable against the right clicks coming out from the Life Sealer. Just trading hits more often. What we're going to see here, Banana 
getting pursued. They're not going to be able to catch up to him, though. He's already got 375 movement speed with just, with just the brown booties. So, Jixing unable to chase down with the Hunter of the Night, but he is still in a kind of a commanding position now in this lane. Although he's behind in last hits, Jixing with level 5, with phase boots, uh, no phase boots on the way, he's going to go for a bottle crow actually. So I was going to say, with the Hunter of the Night and the phase boots, he would be able to really pressure Mu back, but although Mu won't be able to like farm a stacked jungle or anything with safely, he still is going to be able to sit back here and go for the long range raises. So meanwhile, Bristleback is actually going to be heading out to stack his Ancients for himself and is going to be bottle crawling as well on the Dire side here. You see the empty bottle, and on the Radiant side here, Shitty Wizard. So we're going to be seeing maybe a potential kill on Sancheng now. There's a little bit of vulnerability on the Rubik here, but unless the Venge has a TP, it's probably a bad move because then the Centaur at least cleans up one and probably chases for the second one without a response. So Bottle and the Phase Boot's going to be coming out for Jixing, and this is where he gets pretty deadly. We'll see if he can actually find an opening. Shadow Fiend using all three raises with the regen rune. Good efficiency there. And we'll see how this pans out. It looks like AO will walk right into two. Banana catching him out with some good Arcane Bolt harassment. He's pretty tanky at 739 HP. Magic Stick is available as well, but they're still kind of looking for some damage on him. And they will bring him down to 200. So, um, Squishier here, and he'd be dead, but the Kunkka is capable, and he'll be perfectly fine to just kind of play a little bit more reserved, get a Tango from an ally, and try to stay on the lane. Oh, <laughs> close exchange. I think he... I don't know. Uh, I was going to say the rune covers up six-minute spawn, but we're going to see Leshrac pull back into a bad spot here. Not only lifted back, but also slowed up by the Concussor Shot. It's the... Torrent to actually bail him out, and Jixing goes in for the actual return. They go in for more. They're not just happy with the Centaur. They want to dive deeper. Going onto Banana here, they get the Void, and they're going to get the right clicks. Great movement from DG, and they're able to clean it up, but now they're very low HP. Sanching just needs one more right click. Instead, gets baited into it. Now slowed down by the Void. The Cripple, he can't tell Kinesis. He will go down. That is going to be now a three-kill swing for absolutely nothing. DG limp away, but they're all alive. Lifestyle props the Infest on the Dark Troll Summoner to get his full HP bar back, and he can jungle, he can gank, he can do whatever he needs to do. But yeah, great movement here for the first night for the Night Stalker. In fact, he's so confident in it that he goes for a 3-1-2 build, since his level 7 is going to be coming out quickly anyways. Hmm. So? Experience is brought back to even, and even the gold going about 1,300 in favor of Dream Gaming. They're looking really good right now. Great movement early on. Great willingness to dive the towers. And now everybody's got their magic sticks all lined up here. A little bit off-center is AO, but as a whole, they're in a good position to keep gang the gank train rolling. Even though they won't have darkness, as the Night Stalker went for 3-1-2, they're still going to be able to be very aggressive here. And level 8 should come out pretty soon. And that's when he can definitely pick up darkness. There was a a change a long, long time back that uh, reduced the level requirement for or the experience requirement for level seven and level eight, and kind of pushed it back to level uh, nine and uh, ten a little bit, and twelve a lot. And that really helps the nice sucker in terms of experience. But demons is going to be going down here. Just a couple of nukes here and there, the stampede to make sure he's within raise range, and they do get a second kill on the board. So both of the deaths are from the ventral spirit. One uh, kind of a freebie when he was stalking up for the courier, and then one there with the stampede use. So, all in all, DG is playing this pretty smooth, avoiding death while still playing very actively and aggressively. I like that style in general. June here, under the Radiant Observer Ward, is going to be farming these Ancients, but I don't know if they can really punish it. They would love to just kind of like smoke up and pop a torrent. But I'm not sure if that's going to happen. The Dire Observer Ward scouts out AO. June knows the threat, and he's going to back off. Dyer's middle tower is under attack. Jixing has the darkness now, so might actually look to steal some of the creeps, but it's actually going to be the life stealer who can actually do that with the feast. Works out pretty well. He's got the Helm of the Iron Will too, so we can tank this up decently. They can duo it, and Zove will get some good golden experience here. So these are the big ones. All the little creeps were killed off by the Bristleback, but these three big 
Ancient Creeps are really juicy for the Lifestealer and the Night Stalker. 170 gold a pop. They're going to be jumping forward in their net worth, as you can see here. Those two are even better than the Leshrac, who was kind of given a one position in that aggro try. So, frustrating for June that he's not going to be able to progress, but it happens. We're going to actually see an armlet rush here from the Lifestealer, and if the Infest uh, carries him into the fight via the Hunter of the Night, then that's actually a really good item to go. Just jumping in, getting uh, a lot of damage really quickly, fast right clicks coming out. It's a scary thing for a newbie to deal with, to be honest. They don't have that great of heroes to deal with armlet toggles either. Like the Bristleback Quill Spray might hit incidentally, but otherwise, the damage coming in from newbie is going to be very predictable. So armlet toggles, I could expect two or three in a fight, and that would be amazing if Zove can pull it off. Again, I don't know this guy's skill level, so we'll have to see, but it's going to be Stampede forward, Telekinesis pullback. Demon still gets the stun off, but he will be raised down. No, Moo misses. Moo misses the raise. It's an E-raise, and now he can't get him. Oh, the last right click doesn't miss to the Crippling Fear, but Sanchang now in a bad spot, and we're going to see Teal's damage come out. Big ultimate coming out. The Pulse Nova just tearing through them, and they get a double kill for Jixing. Now the Torn connects. Banana taking some damage over time, but... It looks like he will survive. He will back off to base, and they'll be happy with that two for one. And that's during the daytime, too. Taking these fights at daytime while the darkness is on cooldown is actually a really good thing for Dream Gaming to accomplish. They're really gaining confidence against Newbie here, Again, making sure that the stampedes aren't really that impactful from the centaur, and in general, just controlling this early game really well. This next night is going to be a decisive uh, factor for how the game progresses from here, though. So, I think that, really, if DG can just pile it on during this next night with the armlet timing that it as it is, I think that they can actually just run over Newbie throughout this game. But, if they kind of slip, if they go for something aggressive, dive a little bit too deep, and Newbie turn it back around, that is going to look more like their game to come back from. Because they're going to get a lot more power when, when Rabbit finds his Blink Dagger. In the safe lane, you usually look at your centaur as one of the top two or three farmers. In this case, he's down at sixth place because of the pressure the aggro tribe put out. So he's only got 59 last hits here, and he needs more to get that blink dagger out. And then, uh, like I said, pipe of insight is probably really important because did you guys see how much damage that pulse nova was putting out? Pretty ridiculous. 100 Radiance per second, with only 20 mana cost per second. Level 1 Pulse Nova is no joke. Really, really strong. They're going to go for, it looks like a gank play. I don't think they go for the Roche here. And Dire do see this double damage picked up, but whether or not they do anything, can respond fast enough is a different story entirely. The smoke is in play. They're looking for the opportunity. want to pop the darkness. As soon as the smoke pops, they go anyways. They wave terror. They phase forward. And this is not as safe as they want it to be. This is pretty far no man's land for many towers. And if uh, DG see them now, they can go for a very aggressive dive with this double damage rune. They don't have BKB and Night Stalker, so they have to approach carefully. But I still think they're going to look for this dive. Or at least directly pressure the tier 1. I mean, Lifestealer's right here with, ready to do that. Ah, oh, man. They get the D ward out. They see... What the enemy sees, and although they get 50 gold for it, we're going to see Newbie do the same. They get a really smart D ward out onto this plateau. Like this D ward, this is pretty standard. We see a lot of times that ward is picked up, even from the dire side, but this is a really brilliant timing for Newbie to take care of. Shadow Fiend will destroy the tier 1 tower on the top lane. Last Shrike will destroy the tier 1 tower on the bottom. The Blink Dagger comes out for the Centaur, the TP is there as well. So there is a real possibility that Rabbit could counter-initiate with a TP, Blink Dagger, and the Stampede. Ao though, with the flank, has didn't doesn't he does have vision. The Night Stalker has so much night vision, they can go for a boat play here. X Mark is out of range at only level two, but they could go for a boat, torrent, out of the fog of war, and June would be caught completely unawares. They don't have the nether swap to follow it up, and again, still no BKB on that Night Stalker, but I feel like there's some real aggressive potential if they can just get their, their combo off the way they want to. For now though. This is the dire vision. This is all they can see. Quite limiting, and they split. They can actually split her through, so that you can cut, walk right through the trees here. Oh, this is scary. This is scary stuff. Ao in a perfect position. He gets the X mark out right where he wants it. Combos it up, but June doesn't get hit by the torrent or the boat. 
The open wounds will frustrate him, but oh, it misses just barely. That would have been such a good pickoff, and instead Rabbit goes in with a stomp. The double edge. Oh, the stampede. Nice secondary torrent, that 10 second cooldown. Helping out quite a bit here, but Night Stalker will still die. Apparently, a wandering our tower auto attack was chasing him down, and he does fall. So. Ah, <sighs> tough call. I mean, Dream Gaming, they go for a play, but just slightly mistiming the torrent. If they haven't practiced this hero perfectly, that timing could be very difficult to connect with. It's like how when we first saw Alina with Yules, we saw so many missed Lightstalker rays, but over time, it became a guaranteed thing. Well, this is still kind of early in the Kunkka metagame, and I, I can imagine it's, it's really difficult to make sure that's so precise. Even still, it's a costly mistake as they dive in after it. They lose a lot of momentum. They did kill the Rubik here, which is nice. But, I mean, just the bottom line is diving into the tower, losing the Night Stalker like that. That entire nighttime is wasted almost. And Centaur with that blink. Very scary. BKB is going to come out for Mu about the same time it does come out for his nemesis, Jixing on the Night Stalker. And pretty much the same items, right? I mean, this net worth value. Actually, Mu is way ahead, unless Jixing is dropping an item. Wonder why that is. I think I'm missing something. Huh. Oh well. I, it seems like there should... Oh, it's because it's a magic stick instead of magic wand, and the phase boots are cheaper than treads. I was just comparing the net worth and the inventories, and I'm like, that doesn't look like a 1300 gold difference, but with a little bit of gold in pocket here for Moo, and the fact that the BKB isn't done yet, the small little thing differences add up. A few hundred gold here, a few hundred gold there. We're going to see a uh, Tower Deny in the mid tier 1, it looks like. Going to go ahead and take care of that, no problem. They could jump on mid, they're going to try for it, but it's too late. Radiant Night Stalker already gets the deny. Still, if he pushes forward with this next creep wave, that's going to be your Blink War Stomp, and that's going to be a pretty easy kill onto the Daywalker. Going to be able to bring him down inside the Mystic Flare. Nice double uh, split Earth, but now it's on Sancheng, and Sancheng doesn't have any delay on it. Oh, if he only gets the Telekinesis, that would be a kill, but doesn't actually get the opening there, and Leshrock will fall back. So, going to be moving in towards the Dyer's advantage now. Golden experience. Newbie waited out that critical night time between 12 and 16 minutes. And now they're in a pretty good position in this game, I think. The Lifestealer's got to do some work. They, they actually, I feel like Dream Gaming now have much more need to actually make something happen. Because they're up against June's mechanism. They're up against the Moo's BKB. Like, in this position, they're able to do so much more with these defensive items. If the Pipe of Insight comes out on Rabbit then suddenly DG just have no damage. They can't kill anybody except for with the Lifestealer. And he's a hero that loves to pick up two or three items, like Armlet and SNY at the least, to stay on target and to actually do good right click damage per hit. So just looking at overall items, the Venture Spirit does pick up a Medallion of Courage. We'll see if they can uh, maybe turn that into a Solar Crest, which they can use on the Shadow Fiend. That would be really good. Um, beyond that, yeah, not too much. The BKB is still delayed on the Night Stalker, but he'll have that coming out in just 100 gold. The problem is he doesn't farm fast during the daytime very much either. Like, pretty much you have to farm and sit back because of the fact that it's daytime, but your farm speed is pretty low compared to most other cores, and this gives a lot of time for newbie to bounce back. Now we have a level 11 uh, Bristleback with the pretty much all the items he'd need for this stage in the game. And he has, more importantly, the power treads to switch over to intelligence so that he can use the mechanism. That's what I was complaining about for the broom, the bristleback that was so far behind last game. That bristleback didn't have anything but brown boots. And so the difference maker, the mango bottle magic stick and the int treads changes his amount of mana pool completely. From having 500 mana to 715 is a huge difference here. That 9 intelligence really adds up. So that's uh, important to keep in mind, is just having the mana to really make use of the item. June, the other Bristleback got it off once in the entire game, whereas June's going to be able to use it every fight. We're going to see the Aegis go to the Centaur Warrunner. Interesting choice, but it makes sure that he's going to keep farming and 
uh, able to jump in aggressively without risking his uh, net worth. Obviously, he, he wants to keep moving in towards that item, either BKB or Pipe for sure. Agonins is nice, but you need more sustained throughput. And he actually goes for 4-staff, so... Feels like he's going to be able to accomplish more with that mobility tool over anything else. I mean, 4 staff is great for cutting Lifestealer, so I think that it's still a pretty good item. Not not the decision I would have made, but at the same time I respect it. I think it's really a good counterplay if Zove gets out of control. Because otherwise the person's locked in open wounds, he's got drum phase on you, and he just chews into you. But having mobility from both the Stampede and the Force Staff, it's going to frustrate the Lifestealer quite a bit. Besides, Lishrak isn't getting that crazy farmed. It's not like he's able to just rush out like a Bloodstone, Ag Scepter, Octarine Core BKB build. It's, you know, Yules, level 9 Lushrak, doing some good damage, but not, uh, like, killing everybody in 5 seconds flat. He's going to pull the tower, the creeps back off the tower, so it's going to be harder to siege here with the Diabolic Edict. They not only force, they are not only use the Glyph to cover it, but just the fact that there's no creep wave, Lushrak has to fall back. And this gives uh, Nubia a good spot to defend from. But Darkness will come out. It is Natural Knight now, so he turns it artificial to make it even harder for Nubia to strike. Because they just don't have vision. Like, Dire Vision quite limited here. They're not going to be able to push the bottom tier one either. And that stalemate kind of seems to kind of trespass across the entire map. Like, the stalemate for the defending the tier one tower up top, it parallels with what we see in the safe lane down bottom. Moo, Rabbit, looking for an opportunity here. They can actually force staff forward the Requiem of Souls while he's actually casting it. And that could be like a really cool way to make the Requiem connect on with a blink stun. But Leshrac's actually the one that's in the most danger here, but they're going to go in aggressively onto Sanchang. Nice usage of the Infest. The Stampede doesn't speed him away fast enough, and he will, they will just turn it with Moo's BKB. But now without that uh, Stampede, they're going to have to use the four Staff to disengage if any more spells fly. But in the end, it turns into a one-for-one one with a BKB forced out. BKB for the Night Stalker, BKB for the Shadow Fiend. And yeah, it really comes down to the reaction time. If Rabbit is quick enough to force staff or stampede the Rubik away, then maybe that's a, a one for nil, and that's really good. But as it stands, they just kind of reacted slowly. They weren't ready for that kind of engagement, and they do get caught out. And that's not unexpected, because when you're inside the darkness, as they were, their vision is only at 575 units. It's really hard to know what's lurking around the corner and how to take an engagement when, you know, it's a, essentially the fog of war becomes a clown car of heroes. Just more and more heroes start surging at you and you're not sure if this is a fight you want to take or not. It's it's a difficult decision how to react. I'm going to see demons have a good swap position onto June, but he didn't see him until he kind of broke up past the steps. And Jixing's actually farming now while his BKB is on cooldown. So they'll wait for them to push forward a little bit and then they'll try to go for another flank play. But the Stampede's back up and I think Rabbit wants to get pretty aggressive with his Aegis, looking to dive the tower. Zove should be able to rage through the hoof stomp though, so I think they have to go for demons, and they will dump on him, quick stun, the double edge, and the kill. That's the death of the Vengeful Spirit, and that's perfectly fine for Newbie. Taking the tier 1 tower, taking down the Venge, any kind of forward momentum like that is going to give them a lot of traction this game. 3300 gold, 7500 experience, wow, they are leading heavily in levels. Fifth, level 15 on the Shadow Fiend. Level 13 on the Bristleback parallels the Lifestealer he 1v1'd. I am I am really just astonished at how low level the Night Stalker is in the end. Night Stalker has died three times. He hasn't really been able to take full advantage of the night time, and the end result here is he is only level 11 while Moo is level 15. That's a huge difference. I mean, Moo's got an eagle song for crying out loud. He suddenly pulled ahead uh, over 4,000 net worth. Like, that's insane. Moo is just farming out of his mind right now. The tower going to go down to the Shadow Fiend, and now Rabbit goes in with the Blink Stomp and the stampede but not he should commit with his aegis a little bit harder here perfectly fine for him to die quickly if they can just get a kill off of it so let's see there's gonna be a torrent hitting onto three great torrent but still connecting some damage onto the life stealer the last raise the double edge it doesn't bring him down and now the aegis brings rabbit back to full so he's gonna be able to reinitiate in just a few seconds here they don't see the centaur they don't see his hp pool but centaur is just gonna be falling back at this point in time 
they probably timed out the Aegis, they probably know that he's full HP, they wouldn't have committed to a bad fight. So in the end, Life Stealer for the Rubick, and the BKB was used by both sides once again. So nice pickup on the Life Stealer. He's looking for it could be a number of items. AC seems the most reasonable though. Yeah, I can't imagine he'd he'd go for much else other than AC. It's just interesting to look at the possibilities with the new plate mouse. That uh, probably a four step. Yeah, two four steps will be up for newbie pretty soon, and they'll be Dyer's looking for a third perhaps on attack. Rubik. Could go for a Yule's too. Not bad. But the big pickup is of course going to be this Shadow Fiend. Uh, getting the butterfly here at this stage of the game is absolutely insane. Because uh, there's one thing that a lot of people don't actually realize from the last patch change, but because they changed how mute and break mechanics work, it essentially means that you can break passives that are built into the heroes, but you actually can't break passives from items. So even if you're hit by an Agadim Scepter Doom, uh, it doesn't matter, your butterfly is still going to take full effect. You're not going to be able to use the flutter, but you still get the evasion. So essentially, until MKB comes out on the Lifestealer, this butterfly makes Mu the most powerful hero in the game. He is just insane. They cannot hit him, they have to nuke him down with spells, and he still has an 8 second BKB. So they're going to find their opening, demons will go down with again. His fifth death this game, unfortunately. That is, of their nine kills, five of them are on the Vengeful Spirit. Just, uh, he happens to be the one they find every single time. But, it's the life of the support. Low HP, easy to jump on, low mobility to respond to things. It's a hard, hard life for him. Bristleback also has a 10 second BKB, so all the more reason to get aggressive here. Pop in the mechanism, every full HP, and Rabbit almost catches out Zove. Nice Rage Dodge of the Hoof Stomp, and a Spell Steal of the Lightning Storm. Sanchez doesn't have that much mana, and he's actually going to go down here to the Boat Torrent. Very nicely played by Ao on the Kunkka. So, that's going to be them. their cause to retreat here. They didn't pop BKBs on anybody, so... They're pretty confident with just what they exhausted, but here, 26-20. Keep the timer on that, because that is Shadow Fiend's timer for the double damage rune. Any team fight breaks out before 28-15. Oh man, Shadow Fiend is gonna be in such a good place in the fights. And we actually might see it here. Stampede is not available just yet. 40 seconds was just recently used, but if they can force a fight, if they can get a good blink hoof stomp, you better believe that uh, Moose is gonna run in there, pop the BKB, pop the double damage rune, and clean house. He's got an AoE negative armor aura of 6. He's got already um, about 260 right click damage. You add in another 130, bring that to 390, and oh my gosh, it's just insane. But still, they have to find that initiation, and again, 2820 is the timer for that DD rune. So we'll look back over the graphs here. We see 7500 gold is in, is in favor of newbie. The experience graph is kind of just wavering back and forth. Not much more momentum gained by newbie in that department. And that means levels are catching up for the lower level supports. Maybe Venge will find her second level nether swap soon enough. And uh, other heroes will approach her level 16. Rage is actually really good for the Rubik this game. I don't think that's a bad spell skill at all. Some games it's kind of useless, but this game definitely. Not just for Rage TP, but to actually make things happen. Oh my, the Wave of Terror going to catch out Rabbit, caught in by the X marks the spot, will be pulled into the torrent, into the boat. Great combo there from Ao. Makes redeems himself for what happened down bottom with two consecutive perfect torrents. Now we see Banana, Sancheng, June make their rotations. They will not, however, catch out Demons. And it's going to be them marching down bottom. I'm actually not sure they're going to be able to make anything happen here. They'll just TP away. Yule Scepter for Leshrac. We'll see what item he wants to pick up next. Obviously, there are two options now. Octarine Core and Bloodstone. Both very powerful on this hero, but... I'm not sure which one will really generate the most traction in this game. Bloodstone, I think, potentially could. But, I mean, I, I could argue either, really. So, we're going to be seeing, as far as overall item progression, Nightstalker picks up the Sanj. Probably have Heaven's Halberd for him. As the BKB wears down on Mu, he wants to be able to disarm him. And it is going to be the Bloodstone for the Leshrac, so we'll see how well he progresses there. 
And that's about it. <laughs> Other than that, we've talked about all the items, talked about all that good stuff. Agonim Scepter can come out for Rabbit next, meaning they don't have a Pipe of Insight, just the Mechanism and the two BKBs. But we're going to see another jump. Demons should be dying for the sixth time this game. But no, they actually find a different stomp onto Jixing here. And that could be a really nice kill. There's another swap out if they need it. But actually, it's going to be June on the run. Pops the BKB. The X mark will take no effect. But here comes Shadow Fiend. Unfortunately, able to do anything. The Stampede, pretty wasteful there, actually. Once you hear that Stampede, you assume they're going to do something. But they just couldn't find their opening. And that Stampede completely uh, wasted. They're going to have to wait that cooldown out. Still seem to be willing to commit to the pit. I mean, right now, DG aren't the most confident either. In fact, they're they're falling back here to their side of the map, and the darkness is not in effect. So, Roche definitely could be an option, and I think both sides know it, but it looks like Nubia are the ones to actually make that attempt sooner rather than later. Dyer's middle tower is under attack. Roshan has fallen to Dyer's So we're going to see the Aegis go to Shadowfiend. No problem at all. It's going to be really strong to fight with two lives here. Now that he has the lifesteal, he has all the right-click damage he needs, and that evasion, which again, just is going to be very difficult for the lifestealer to deal with directly. Like, you're pretty much going to have to leave the Shadowfiend as the last man standing, which is the last thing you want to do up against a hero that just is kind of his entire skill set is offensive like every single one of his skills has real offensive potential and it allows him to just go for heavy damage output without with kind of reckless disregard for caution but i think they're going to be a little passive for a minute they could just farm the agonim scepter on the centaur and then they're in really good spot but we'll see for right now he's 700 gold off and they seem to be wanting to at least push the tier 2 tower so we'll see them make their moves that way in the meantime, any other possible items? We see Glimmer Cape for Kunkka, so pretty cool here. Um, can do X mark plays with Invis. Can uh, anybody that's about to hit, get hit by a Requiem, he can put the magic resistance on them and give them a huge amount of survivability there. Even then, in the Mystic Flare, somebody can be Glimmered out. The Silence obviously not affecting items. So they have a gem on Banana here. Skyrath Mage just carrying around. He's a glass cannon, but he's. Seems confident in his Gem of True Sight. And I'm just now noticing they fixed the tooltip on this. Usually you had to alt text just to see the True Sight radius, but they're, they're letting you guys know. It's 1100. Which is really important for if Night Stalker finishes Axe. Which is kind of why I'm surprised uh, he has the Assange at all, actually. The Assange into Halberd made sense, but it seems like he wants the Axe more. So, for now a casual Assange, then into the Axe, and then back over to the Halberd. They're going to hear a stampede. They're going to find out. Oh, man. Great kill on the last track. Really great opportunity there. Knocking down some bloodstone charges. He'll be back up in 28 seconds, but losing those first three charges of his eight charge bloodstone default is going to be giving them a lot of momentum here. And this is kind of slow rolling, but as the centaur gets that kill, the Aghanims comes out, and I think they push with this. I think they look to go high ground. Now that it's daytime, now that they've got the Aghanim Scepter, and they still have this Aegis here for another two and a half minutes. They've controlled the, the map really well. They've gotten the dominant net worth. They want to make something of it now. So we'll see Skyrath rejoining his allies, and when he does, I think it's just going to be a heavy push in the most convenient of lanes. But Shadowfiend, oh my. If he could find that courier, that would be huge. The courier just making its way there, and he just nopes right back. He's like, no, nah, it's a... I, I'll, I'll worry. We'll worry about that later. We'll, we'll get our special secret items later. And the Kunkka just buy some warts. Not big deal. So what is that? Jixing looking for... Okay, yeah, just the Acceptor. And uh, just newbie kind of hanging out, looking for a pickoff. They find one hero, and they pretty much are open to push the high ground. So they have about you know two minutes of patience where they can go for that play. Unfortunately, yeah, they're gonna have to deward here first. Gem, gem. Who has the gem? Who has the button? It's gonna be banana. Moves brought the creep wave to the front lines, but he doesn't have a team with him, so he's all by himself here. X marks connect, might force out a BKB, or at least everybody needs to get here. 
luckily they're just kind of poking at him. They're not actually committing. If they called that bluff, they could easily have killed Moo. Or at least forced the BKB, like I said. But they... Bristle back here. Not rejoining his allies. He's moving top. Come on! What is this? These are some shenanigans here. Like, they're baiting Moo without the team here. And Bristleback is prioritizing the Bounty Rune to refill his bottle and go farming. Like, I feel like there's some miscommunication and kind of... Both side, both all the members of the team really wanting to do different things here. I feel like Shadowfiend wants to end the game with the Aegis now that he has the Butterfly and the Satanic. And then they're like, yeah, let's push out top. Let's get that creep wave going so we don't lose any damage on our tier 2. And then we can kind of push in all the lanes at once. And that's all well and good, but you're creating an opportunity for this smoke play to come through from DG. And also, the Aegis is going to be expiring here in just 20 seconds. So, all in all, yeah, a little bit of... If, distracted movement from newbie they seem to kind of want to do a few different things at once but in the end they're they got the satanic now on the uh, shadow, shadow fiend so they don't really have to worry about the aegis expiring he's still gonna have a really healthy life and a lot of durability to chew through no matter if he has one life or two and if he uses the satanic right and he doesn't get disarmed he should actually still have kind of two health bars worth with the potential life steal there So Sanjin Yasha comes out for the Bristleback, Aghanim Scepter, and a thousand gold for the Night Stalker. And at a bit of an impasse, they look for a Courier Snipe, they don't find it, and I, they are going to wait it out until it's natural nighttime. This is the, another thing that I'm not too sure about, is Night Stalker is much more powerful during the nighttime, and although Darkness will give you 50 seconds of that, this is going to give them 4 minutes. So it's a bit different, but we do see demons in an interesting position here. Oh man, terrifying really. These gigantic heroes. This guy only has 4,500 net worth and there's these just titans marching around outside. He hears their footsteps, their hoof beats. And uh, yeah, it's just gonna be him hiding out. Not sure really what he gets out of that. This position here, an aggressive stance. Maybe he gets an observer word out after they leave and the Gemitru site won't take that away immediately, but still. I'm not sure what that flanking position could otherwise prevail. And there's the ward. So this has actually dragged on quite a bit now. 10,000 net worth does favor newbie, 12,000 experience as well, but... DG are kind of gaining time, and they're getting time to get critical items up. But, oh, man, if they can find Jixing here, they're going to pop the BKB. Good, forceful thing there, and they just steal the crippling fear from out from under him. So now Silence could go out on the Lesh Rack, and he's going to have to use it off or get caught out in a very long silence. Now the nighttime isn't so bad. Whether it's darkness or whether it's the natural night, crippling fear is just as good on Rubik during the nighttime as it is on the Night Stalker, and that could be a huge thing to apply to a hero like Lesh. But just forcing the BKB isn't enough for them to kind of call the arms up to the high ground. And uh, so just trying to farm up his next big thing. MKB does come out, does cancel, counter out the butterfly pretty nicely, but looks like Shadowfiend's happy to farm up the crit. Moo building up his net worth substantially, just continuing to build their advantage and uh, look to end it slowly but surely. Agon of Scepter, though, coming out for the Night Stalker with this last hit, and that is going to be a really big find for them. They can start actually moving out across the map, and if they could steal the Skyrath's gem, if they kill Banana and get the gem, they could take the entire map back. That would be insane. But for now, map back rhymes with map hack, and that's what we've got here on the Night Stalker. You're going to see, like, over these trees, this is the Fog of War. You can see, like, to this distance is how far he can see, and he does get a gem picked up by demons. So Venge buys a gem, and here comes that map control. Just looking at Radiant Vision only, they're marching out across the map, and they can see everything here. Any wards that they happen upon, they're going to be able to take care of them. But at least for now, they're not making the right move that way. And uh, they're just kind of marching out as five. They'll make their move that way. They know there's going to be something. And they sh do not actually catch Vision of the ward until just now. They'll see it. 
So that's the 1100 range we're talking about. Anyways, up here they see uh, the rotation of DG outside the base now, and I think Newbie were waiting for that. They're waiting for them to kind of spread out a little bit, say, we're hungry for farm, we're hungry to take the map back, and they could easily go ahead and uh, look for the initiation now. They've got still got the Crippling Fear for Sancheng. They've got the Aghanim Stampede. There's a lot of potential for them to take the right fight, but at least for now, still that Night Stalker getting all that vision. Seeing Radiant's everything around here, and uh, the line is kind of drawn. Two sides won't really break against one another just yet. Still kind of move farming and focused on farming. So that's going to be waiting out until the daytime, but here it is, Aegis and Cheese. The thing we've all been waiting for, the catalyst for action, getting that next immortality, getting the Cheese sustenance, this is how you end the game. Mu can buy out for Daedalus with this in pocket, and this is going to be really good. Aegis is on Mu, and Daedalus is a little bit of ways off, isn't it? I mean, the crit costs 2120, the Daedalus itself costs about 3400 more. So he is still a little bit, 600 gold off. If they wait for anything, it's just buying that item, and then they go. With Satanic, Aegis, Daedalus Butterfly, and BKB, they should be able to take on the world. Mu nearly could like 1v3, so at this point I hope they could 5v5. But we'll see. Obviously Rabbit needs to make sure he gets his stampede off at the right time. Sometimes a uh, stray silence or something could make that more difficult. So he'll get his BKB up pretty soon, and... Oh, we also see uh, Moo's Demon Edge here coming on out. So that's going to go from the... <laughs> and the bottle, too. Going to be going from the Secret Shop over to the Fountain. He's going to pick the recipe, and that's when they actually commit to the push. For now, they'll just kind of poke and prod, do a little bit of slow siege, do some tiny snippets of damage. But June, he wants his AC. Not going to find it, though. It's going to be the, the Daedalus that they get out on the Courier here. And up top, it's actually going to be a flank to gank play. The Infest is available for the Night Stalker. But they don't actually find the Centaur. Now they see him jungling up, and they he has absolutely no idea. Darkness, they see so much more night and day between Radiant and Dire here. Rabbit has absolutely no idea, but he blinks away. He heads back to his allies and conveniently dodges out a 2v1. I mean, of course, with Stampede, unless he's locked down that entire time, he's not going to get soloed. And there's the Daedalus. At this point, I, I'd say just they pushed out one more wave bottom, then they go mi all mid. All five all mid, and they should be able to take that high ground. They just have to be a little bit worried about Kunkka and making sure that they BKB the boat. If they BKB the boat and Torrent, then they should be in a great spot to take the, the high ground. All right, here we go, boys. 42 minutes in, there is a 18,000 gold advantage. About the same experience, Moo. Getting hit by some damage here. Medallion frustrates him, but his right clicks are far more substantial. And they're just going into this without all the heroes. They have four heroes here. One in back. That's Sancheng on the Rubik, who needs to get here. He goes, grabs the Blink Dagger from the side shop, and better use it to quickly get to the high ground, because I think they're going to start the fight without him. I, I think that he's going to be on the back line here. Blink Force and Stampede will get here quick, but the fight is beginning now. A lot of damage going up against the Life Stealer. He is going to bounce back here. That was actually, I believe, the X mark on him. So that he could kind of go aggressive and still heal back up. So if I exit him back, and that long duration of 8 seconds really allows you to kind of go in and, and get that pull back. But they don't force out any cooldowns, no BKBs, no nothing like that. And we're going to see the 2 minute timer for Mu. He's going to go in right onto the tower. The torrent misses, the tier 3 is gone, and now they have to commit. They get the split earth, but he's got so much for him. Sancheng going in, going to be stealing up the split earth here. Dixing on the front line, popping the BKB. Now they get the boat across, and they will be able to send back uh, Zov. Magic immunity uh, for allies does not negate that. He's still going to be pulled back. Torrent will connect on a Mu, but still Melee Rax is down. June still on the front line with the cheese, with the mech off cooldown with the BKB. So they take down two racks, and I think they want to go down mid. The creep waves are complying pretty well here, but we do see Centaur TPing back. So he's gonna immediately TP back, pick up the BKB, and force Blink to the front line. But that means they're gonna have to wait at least a 30 seconds to get him into the fight. Bristleback picking up the AC off the core here. This is really good stuff from them. Still, if they were falling back, they'd have June heal up right now. They're not falling back. They're just waiting a little bit longer 
and now they're going to be going, looking to go in again. But Aegis has exactly one minute left on it. They have to make this timing count. Mu has to go in pretty much now. Just walk right up to them. Show them what you've got with this Aegis and with this next BKB. Rabbit getting the connection of the stun. They're going to be able to swap them out and no repercussions for demons either. So that's actually really good for him. But still Mu walking right up to the high ground. He's got that timer left on the Aegis. He's going to be fine. Mech will keep him up. Hex will lock him down a little bit. He's going to get targeted. Bowden, that's Mu's first life down. He'll have to BKB with the second one. He's going down once, as you see. But Leshrac now caught out. Buyback is not available for him. And it's a boat the other way. Rubik stealing it and getting the rum onto Bristleback. Bristleback is nigh unkillable now and has the cheese to back himself up. He can go under tier fours if he needs to, but here it is just taking the racks. GG is called. Newbie take the first game of this two game series. And they are, are I mean, even if it's only a 12 to 12 lead, they were dominant this game. Just completely controlling the map. That, I think it was 22 to 26 minute nighttime was the one that Night, the Night Stalker just didn't do enough in. And they needed to keep that momentum up to maintain map control. Otherwise, Newbie with their superior mid to late game strategy were able to just kind of build their advantage and go in for the, the final kill. Killing off the core heroes at the end, they get a clear win here with uh, no major repercussions. They still had cheese, they barely used the Aegis, Satanic and BKB were available for Mu. They could have taken that fight and a half. They could have done so much more, but as it was, they took the fight clean, they made sure that they had that resounding victory, and they'll be going in very confidently into game number two. Now, once again, I won't be covering game two. I'm going to turn it over to my man Cyclops. He's going to cover the last game here for today for I League China. I've got to take a quick break and get ready for a European tournament. That's East Portal. And uh, I'm going to be covering a best of five over there with Nahaz. So if you're interested in that, check out twitch.tv slash eSportal. Covering it for that on behalf of BTS as well. But for now, this is going to wrap up I League for today. So took seven games in a row here for our I League China got some awesome Dota 2 action here in 6.84 and it was a, a pleasure to cast for you guys so thank you guys so much for tuning in once again uh, shout out to Beyond the Summit that's beyondthesummit.tv check out their website and of course if you enjoyed the commentary look me up twitter.com slash blazecasting so I'm going to turn it over to Cyclops the stream will go down no picnic and uh, we'll be seeing you guys tomorrow bright and early at least for me it's I'm going to be starting up the broadcast for tomorrow's I League it's 7 to 11 a.m. for me. If you want CEST, I believe that is 1300 hours. So 13 o'clock, whatever you want to call it. We'll go for four hours there. But for now, that wraps it up. Game one of Newbie versus Dream Gaming in the books. Game two going to be coming up shortly, but with a small break to switch up the streams. Thank you guys so much for tuning in. You guys have a great afternoon, morning, evening, wherever you may be in the wonderful world of Dota 2.